Uh, and Paul's going to be introducing the whole concept of, of unity, what it means to be unified together as, as a body. Um, throughout the chapter, we see these, these focusing on individuals, right? Through chapter 1, he calls us saints or set apart for works to be done. It says in verse 6 that, that God's at work in you, right? He's begun the good work. He'll be faithful to complete it in you. He's going to carry it through. This is what God does. And it gives us that creed, right, to live as Christ and to die as gain. And last week we talked about, um, you know, really the, the opposition we face, our responsibilities, right, to put on the gospel. And Paul uses that word co- conduct, which is the idea of being a citizen of heaven, how to working out your faith, right, as a citizen of heaven, living out your faith here in Merced, USA, right, and the surrounding areas. And um, so this, this idea is he's kind of going into, as a church, focusing in unity of a church, you know, how we function together, and, and the mark, the purpose, or, or maybe the, uh, uh, the shining bright, Lord, uh, of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ into the community. That's what I'm trying to get out there. That as we work together and we fight for unity, as we, we demonstrate these things, not only individually, but as a church, um, you know, our, our, our gospel is proclaimed ever more so. It's even louder. So we're going to talk about unity this morning. Um, many of you may know that uh, the Peanuts, um, I love technology, sometimes it doesn't love me. Um, Charles Schultz, who did the Peanuts character, and there's this story of, of Lucy and Linus who were um, watching television, and, and Lucy tells Linus to get up and change the channel, right? And this is before remotes. Okay, so it's actually get up to the TV and change the channel. That's maybe before, yeah, before remotes, college kids, yeah. Uh, when you had to get, I remember being a kid, and that was my dad, right? Get up and change the channel. I was like, yes, dad. And you had to wait there. Nope, one more, nope, one more, one more. So there's this story, right? There are this, this cartoon of the Peanuts, and you have Lucy telling Linus, hey, get up and change the channel. And he responds saying, you know, what gives you the right to tell me to get up and change the channel? And she, she reminds him, I have these, these five fingers, and he's like, well, what's the big deal with your five fingers? And she says, well, the five fingers individually don't really make much. So when I roll them over into this tremendous fist, it becomes this unified source of leverage, right? And, of course, Linus responds, and he says, um, you know, what channel would you like? <laughs> so he goes to the channel, and as he walks over to the, to the television to change the channel, he's looking at his hand, he's going, why can't you guys get organized like that? <laughs> right? So you have this idea of unity. Individually, right, we have a responsibility with God to live out our faith. But when we come together as a church, we're unified. And I probably don't want to have the, the closed fist kind of, you know, as a, as, a, as a picture there for us. But we want to be unified together. So here's what Paul is getting at, right? So here's our passage, Philippians chapter 2. And this is verses 1 through 4. He says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each, each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let me offer a brief prayer. Fathers, we come here this morning, and as we've sung these songs and worship, I pray you would keep us in an attitude of worship as we hear your word. Lord, turn our eyes continually to you, our lives to you now, and let us learn from uh, your word, and let it grow to application. Let it shape and mold us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're talking about unity, and there's really, I think there's, at least two reasons, right? Two things that we can say that it's important for you and I to come together in unity. And the first one is kind of this example. I always think of it as a time of war, right? If there's war and you have individual soldiers coming together to fight an opponent, right? And there's this idea of, I don't know you, I don't know you. However, we're going to come together because we have this battle in which to face. And so therefore, we, because of this enemy, we come together in unity, right? And we could say that for a lot of different ways. There could be, you know, a, a purpose. Coworkers come together and work. There is something we have to accomplish together, and it produces this idea of unity, right? But what happens if that reason that you and I come together for unity is taken away? 
Right? So in the, in, the, in the Christian church, we would say you and I, don't, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and powers. Thank you for no one yelling that out at me. You could have helped me there on that one. Right? Um, <clears throat> what if, that's, what if, what if we, you know, we, we war here, we, we engage the enemy at this level? Well, what happens, we say, if the enemy was to say, you know what, I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to attack the church. I'm not going to attack these Christians. Now, that isn't going to happen, right? The enemy's roaring around like a lion. He's trying to divide. He's trying to attack. He's looking for another angle all the time. That's not going to happen. Well, what if that was taken away? Where would you and I be left with, right? If, if the purpose for us coming together was to oppose the enemy, and the enemy decided, hey, I'm going to take a break, what, if, what would that mean for you and, you and I? Why would, would we disband? We'd say, well, it's, you know, hey, we're good for now. Maybe we'll, you know, if something happens, give me a call. We'll come back together. Would we do that? No, of course not, right? We would continue to pursue it. We would continue to come together. And that's what the idea is, even though that's important, right? The idea of, of coming together and battling and those types of things and having a common goal. Most importantly is that you and I in a fellowship of, of knowing Christ, right? Of experiencing his grace and his mercy propels us. So the real true foundation for unity is, is Christ, right? The fact that you and I know Jesus. Because we have experienced, as Paul says in this, right, we've experienced fellowship, we've experienced comfort, we've experienced encouragement, we've received all these things from Jesus, and therefore we have a responsibility, right, to live out and to, to conduct ourselves in a way that we are unified as a church, that we can promote Christ, right? So we have this idea that we need to come together for the sole purpose of the gospel. And it's interesting because we could say, even though that's a good thing, but there are still dangers, right? You could say, you and I, we're followers of Jesus. Tyson, I know the, the, the Lord, he's, he's my master, he's my savior, I'm going to follow him, but we still have this problem of sin, right? And sin can easily come in, get us off track, help us to focus on the wrong things. The next thing you know, we have disunity, and the enemy loves that. The enemy loves to create disunity in the church. The enemy loves to divide churches. The enemy loves to divide families, right? He's, he's on it. He's not taking a break. So you and I have a responsibility not only to follow after Christ and say, yeah, I'm a part of that. I, he's my Lord and my Savior. He's everything. I want to be part of it. But we have to be aware and be smart. We have to be mature. We have to be understanding that the enemy is still roaring. We have to protect, right, and be uh, actively engaging and helping one another. And that's the idea of unity. Paul's going to do some, some things here. I think he, he's, he's brilliant in his thinking, of course. He's under the power of the Holy Spirit in writing this. But he really walks through, and I think he just kind of answers three questions we might have about unity. Right? He kind of says, I'm going to explain what unity is. I'm going to show you what it looks like in action. Right? And then I'm going to go on from there and tell you how you can get it right? and how you can keep it. That's really what he does in these four verses. And those are the questions, really, I want to address this morning. I think that leads into my first point, what I'm calling unity defined, right? Paul is going to define unity. It's important for you and I that if we say, okay, I'm a part of Faith Bible Church. What does that mean for, for unity in the church? Um, you know, what, what, what does that look like? If we were to ask those questions, and we'd be completely genuine in that. I think those are great questions. And Paul probably understands that thing in this way, and he, in essence, explains it. He, re, he says in verse 1, Right? Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Right? So a few things jump out to us right on this verse. First, he says, therefore. Right? He's concluding his argument. So he's building upon everything that we've talked about up to this point. Right? So we think of just that creed alone, right? To live is Christ, to die is gain, right? You're a citizen of heaven. You have all these things, and he's saying, therefore, right? Because of all this, therefore, right? Go, in essence. He says, therefore, and then he also gives us the if statements. If this, which reciprocates, right, a then, which comes in verse 2. So if Right, so what are these things? Well, if Paul's going to tell us what this is, I'm going to list them out. We'll go through them this morning. The first one, he says, there's any consolation in Christ. And maybe a better word I think I put in your notes is encouragement. Have you been encouraged because of Jesus? Is there encouragement of him? We'd probably say, if you're a follower this morning, yes, I've been encouraged by Jesus. Right, so we want to look to Jesus and say, okay, Paul is saying, if there's any encouragement that you have received, 
from Jesus, what would that be? Jesus taught his disciples that they were to covet the lowest places at the table, right? They were not to lord it over anyone, but they were to be servants. When Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 21, he prayed for all who would believe, he says these words, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So we are to be one. This idea of encouragement in Jesus this is what it means to be in Christ, encouraged by him. So this leads to my, like my fill-in here. This is a unity that the world can see. So we're talking about defining what unity is. It is a visual. It is a, an action, right? It is you and I living it out with the right deeds or gestures or speech, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we think, the way we react, right? tells us the importance. Have we received encouragement from Jesus? Is he the, our motivator? So then when we ask this question, do you believe that you, Jesus is encouraging you this morning to pursue unity? I kind of like these ideas of, of uh, um, visualizing. I'm a visualized type learner, so I like to think about you know, seeing Jesus. The idea of having a conversation when I pray, I like to just kind of visualize what it means to talk to someone. Helps me to, to kind of stay on, 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 on task in my prayer, so to speak, so I don't just kind of float around everywhere. But think about that for a word picture. Could you see Jesus saying, hey, I want to encourage you. Fill in your name, right? Tyson, Jim Bob, whatever. Right down the line, fill in your name and say, do you see him encouraging you? Going, I want you to pursue in this. Therefore, if you've received this, this encouragement, right? Continue to in it. Continue to go forward. Do you see Jesus doing this for you? I'd say if we have some difficulty with this, we might realize we have maybe uh, our focus on our own desires and not upon his. If he's stressing to his disciples, if his prayer is that we would be one, we have to realize he's encouraging us to pursue and to know him, right? To follow after him, to become his witnesses. So that's the first thing that, that Paul hits on, right? Encouragement. If you have received encouragement, he's laying the foundation, right, for the therefores or the thens. The second one he mentions is comfort and love, right? As followers or believers, we must be patterned, right? Our love must be patterned in the love with which God loves us. And that's so important, right? So here we're talking about unity in the church. Maybe you can think of situations or, or moments where you have had uh, a conversation that maybe got a little awkward, where you felt somebody had a, a different opinion about something. You know, as a pastor, you always hear how people have different views on, on maybe some minor doctrines and how that just kind of rubs other people the wrong way. Now, it's important, and when I, say, when I speak of doctrines, right, there's major doctrines. We were going to say that Christ alone saves, right? These are important. The virgin birth, right? All these things are major doctrines. We say about minor doctrines. Minor doctrines would be something to the effect of, you know, when the rapture happens. We have some liberty in that. Is it post, pre, mid, right? So we have some, some, some uh, latitude in those types of decisions. We can have, maintain our fellowship and have different views. But I've come across, maybe you've come across, some people who have a different opinion about some things, and it leads to a fracture, right, in our relationship. And it's important because Paul is saying, hey, if you've received from Jesus comfort and love, right, we'd have to think about this moment of God actually uh, at work in us and changing us, and, and, and maybe, I'm not going to raise my hand to this, but I don't, I don't know if you have all your doctrine is perfect, Right? Does anyone have their doctrines? Have you ever gotten to that point where you just think, maybe I, you know, I've got this all worked out. Um, you know, God's at work in me, yes, but he's, you know, clearly he's, he needs to do more work on you, right? Because I've, I've figured these things out. I'm kind of good. We, no, we wouldn't say that, right? But sometimes we operate this way. So a real task for us is when we have these moments of conversation, remember we're talking about unity. Unity in the church is to listen, right? Maybe there's something we learn, Maybe there's something we go, you know what, I, I was wrong. <laughs> Maybe the, I'm the one God's really working on here. And it's so easy because remember that, that verse where Paul says in, in, in verse 6 of chapter 1, he began this good work, he's still at work, right? He'll be faithful to complete it. So we have to realize that he's at work in us, he's at work in others. And if you think for a moment, does God change his love for you because your doctrine's imperfect? Or your views are imperfect? 
Think about that for a moment. Sometimes we're going, you know what, I'm going to write this person off. I'm just going to pray God keeps working on them, you know, whatever that might be. But God doesn't do that to us. Right? He's patient with us. Right? He's, the, he's the, the demonstration of love. He's patient. He wants to see us move forward. Jesus taught his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 34. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. Right? This statement leaves no room for any qualification. Right? Our love for other Christians must be like Christ's love for us. So it's okay to have differences of opinion. It's okay to have these, these moments, right? Not around core central doctrines, right? We don't, we don't pursue unity at the sake of truth. No, we have to maintain truth. We have to maintain that, and we have to have, be submissive to the authority of God's word, to the authority of Christ. But there are some doctrines we can have latitude on. There's things we can have different opinions on. That's okay, right? We're in process. God's at work in us. So our love for others must be an extenuation, right, of Christ's love for us. So Paul goes on from there, and he's talking about, hey, here's the comfort and love. If you've received encouragement from Jesus, if you've received this comfort and love, you should be experiencing it not only in your own life, but others. And then he mentions the third one, which is the fellowship of the Spirit. Now this is a fellowship that is created by God. It exists not because you know, you and I have things in common. We just didn't one day become Faith Bible Church because we all had one thing in common. Let's just be a church. Ultimately, that's the gospel, right? But as we come together, we don't get to pick and choose who's part of the family of God. Yeah, right? We don't. But we do have a responsibility to love one another, right? To have fellowship with these people. To realize that we are in process. Again, that God is at work in us. He's developing Right? So some of our doctrines are, 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 are being shaped. Right? We're growing in them. We need to demonstrate some patience. Realize that God is at work, and we need to, to extend fellowship. John talks about fellowship in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, where he says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. This means that because we have been brought into fellowship with God, because he has done this work in us, we now have a responsibility to have fellowship with others, right? Our vertical fellowship, this is your fill-in, must lead to a horizontal fellowship. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic because I want to stress the importance of maintaining, right, our, our purity and our doctrine, maintaining the gospel, maintaining the authority of Scripture, but also having some latitude on things, some different opinions, on minor doctrines, and giving grace in those areas. But there is a responsibility that if you have experience, remember Paul is saying, if you have this, right? If you have fellowship with, with God through Jesus Christ, you have a responsibility to engage in fellowship with others, right? With others. He goes on in 1 John, this is still in... in uh, um, chapter 1, 1 John, this is verses 6 and 7. Because the idea is we can't have one without the other. He says, if, if we say that we have fellowship with him, Jesus, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not participate or practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So here is, here is where it can get a little real. <laughs> Might be a better word for that. But I would ask this question to you. Do you have a brother and sister who is a believer, right? A Christian brother and a Christian sister who maybe you're not currently having fellowship with. Right? Maybe there's a Christian follower in your family where there's something has happened we're just not connecting, we're not talking, whatever that might be, the break of fellowship. Now, I understand there's, there's, there's difficulties in life. There's things we come across. There's things that, are, that, that has happened, and now it's a new norm. I'm not talking that, that maybe reestablishing fellowship means we come back and we're you buddy-buddy. Know, we're I'm not going to deny that. If God leads you that way, that's outstanding, right? But sometimes there has to be a, a restoration. There has to be a healing for both, right? Ultimately for you, but also for the other side. 
And John is saying, hey, look, if you're going around saying, on Sundays I love Faith Bible, I love my community, but I have broken fellowship with other believers because of some situation, there is a responsibility on you to restore that. Right? We're talking about unity in the church, the importance, right? Our testimony and how we operate. If we're not willing to go and, and be the person who says, you know what, I'm sorry, or, hey, I, you know, this happened, I just want to, we may agree to disagree on this point, but I, I want to have fellowship with you, and I want to love you, I want to, and, and have that kind of, of demonstration, then why would we expect others, right? The church isn't going to do that. Again, it's around, you know, especially, again, important doctrine. We're not going to compromise important doctrine. If there's minor things that you've fallen out of fellowship with, then you have a responsibility, because John is saying, look, you can't have the one, the vertical, without the horizontal. It's very important. We'd have to say that if that's what's happening, there would be also something lacking in your, your fellowship with God. Right? We might be able to conclude that, because we would say that if we've broken fellowship with other believers, right, who genuinely love the Lord, then we'd have to say that's not because of God. That would have to be because of us. So I'd challenge you, you know, if there's something going on in your life, that you would be submissive to the Holy Spirit. Allow him to lead you. I get it. It doesn't mean that things get, maybe get fixed. It's a new normal, right? Something has happened. Now we're here. But in the midst of that, there has to be grace extended and, and mercy because much has been given to you. So I challenge you on that. Be very prayerful about that. The last one that Paul mentions here, number four, he goes on and says, that the last if here is if you've received affection and mercy. Right? And here he gets at the heart of the motivation of why we do what we do. Unity must be rooted in the knowledge of God's mercy. Right? You have to understand something about God's mercy. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been forgiven your sins, you have some type of understanding about what that mercy is. You and I, right, the moment we were born, we were heading to hell. That's the reality. This is where we were going. Right? Because God demands perfection. He doesn't lower his bar a little bit and say, you know what, I like you guys. Faith Bible, you you're kind of got it going on. Why don't you hop over the bar? I'll make it easy for you. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that for anybody. He shows no favoritism, but he demands perfection. And why, right out of the womb, when you were born, you were born into sin. There, right there, let alone that if you ever said a lie, <laughs> if you ever got angry and did something out of anger, the wrong motive, if gonna, we can go down a list of things, very simple things. Right? We've fallen short of the glory of God. So you have to realize that what we have in Christ, that he has paid a price for us, that you and I, we could never. And that's that moment where we say, man, I could just rest in the mercy of God because he loves me. He cares for me. And it becomes this most profound motivation to maintain unity. Why should I pursue unity? Why? Should, because I have experienced it in Jesus. At the end of the day, right, this is why we don't let the sun go down your anger. Deal with those things. Don't let them fester because small problems become big problems if we don't deal with them, right? Make those connections. Realize what you have in God's mercy. Realize it is for you. Realize that I was destined. I, my own testimony, I knew I was running for hell. Didn't know it until God changed my life. And that's the reality. And in that, I think, God, thank you, Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Because my, my actions is a response to what he has done. So if that is what God has done for us, how can you and I withhold that from others? Right? Speaking to the idea of fellowship, of unity, right? Comfort and love, encouragement. This is, Paul is saying this is what it is. A church, as you function, this is what unity is. This is what unity looks like. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, where he says, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. So Jesus defines it for us. Here it is, right? Love for one another, fellowship with one another, encouragement with one another affection and mercy for one another. So Paul is defined. So here it is. There's our first question. What is unity? Paul goes, boom. Here's your unity. So the next question leads right into if this is what it is, well, what does it look like in action? 
right? It's kind of my second question. So I put unity in action. This is verse two. It says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, right? So here's the then. If you've had all this, therefore then this, right? Note the, the connection, how these are linked, right? Verse one, he says, because there's encouragement in Christ, verse two, be like-minded, right? Because there's comfort in his love, be of the same love. Because there's fellowship of the Spirit, be of one accord. Because there is affection and mercy, be of one mind and purpose. So Paul's saying, look, here's this. If you've experienced this, this is what it is. This is unity. Here's what it's going to look like in your church. Here's what it's going to look like in your life. So the first one, it says, be like-minded. I put to this. I want to, to reduce these to the point where they're, they're appli- applicable or application. To be aware of another's suffering. Or another person's suffering. Now, doctrinal unity, it is important, right? We want to pursue those and maintain those things, but this really speaks to the idea of our attitude, our attitude of knowing one another, right? How do you know someone's suffering if we don't engage them, if we don't know where they're at, if we're not walking with them, right? So to be like-minded is to realize, hey, I know you, right? You know that, you've ever had those person in your life where you say, how's it going there? And you're like, it's good, I'm good, I'm fine, whatever. They're like, no, that's, that's, that's not, what. how are you really doing? Right? They know you. They know when you're trying to put on that facade, right? Oh, I'm good. Yeah, you're smiling, but man, I think behind that smile, there's a lot going on. How are you really doing? And that's the idea, the attitude behind this, right? Being like-minded is to know, be connected with. This is the functionality, right, if you would say, of unity. And I think it's interesting if, if we have, you know, situations may arise and may, we may come across things, but if all parties involved and reg- in dealing with a situation or an issue, if all parties involved had this mindset where they desire to glorify Christ, to be submissive to his word, I guarantee you we could resolve anything, right? We could resolve and maintain fellowship and unity. So Paul says, hey, be like-minded. This is what it looks like. He goes on and says, have the same love, right? Which is to have affection and regard for others. Right? The same love. I have affection. It's, I'm rooted in Christ. He's my motivator. I want to have affection and love for others. It means be willing to do whatever is necessary for the good of the church, the good of others. Hey, see a need. Let me, how can I help you? Right? This is the, the functionality of it, what it might look like. Paul goes on and mentions one accord. Right? To be united in the same character and desires. Right? When our desire to serve God and the church, we can enjoy unity. Carry these out. Maintain them. Then he goes on and says, one mind. Right? Paul's saying, this is, fulfill my joy. Here's what I want you to be doing. He has satisfaction in hearing other believers do this. Have one mind to focus our minds around the gospel. How important is that? Right? Unity. It's the right attitude. It's love. Love of the same. Right? The same passion. The same purpose. The contrast of that is um, divisiveness, bad attitude, to discriminate, promote our own desires, our own agendas, right? We don't want to be on that side. We want to be the side that says, you know what, I love you. I care enough to, to see how you're doing. I want to share in this burden you're walking through. I want to genuinely love you. There was a story of a pastor who went to a conference it was a big church, and he pulled into the parking lot, and he saw these signs that were up above light poles, and one said love. And he walked around the corner after he got his car, another one said patience. He was like, oh, this is kind of like a mall, when you go to a mall to mark where your car's at, right? Instead of it being A1 or, or yellow five, or red dye number five, no. Um, it said patience or love or kindness, right? They were marked out. And the next day, he, he went away, he came back to the conference, and he parked in another part of the parking lot, and there was more words right? Those things going on. He's kind of dawned on him, like, that's, a, that's kind of a really good idea. But he also observed that after the conference, when people were leaving, they left in such a hurried way that they didn't demonstrate patience or love or kindness. And so he had this moment of revelation where he was looking at this going, wow, how simple is it for us to lose these things? Coming from a conference or coming from a church, right? Worshiping God, going out, being concerned about getting a good table at the lunch place, right, and cutting someone off in the parking lot and not demonstrating this idea of kindness or of love or of patience. 
And as he, as he observes these things, he concludes that our unity, right, our faith, our, our walk with the Lord is not so much spoken as it is demonstrated. It has to be carried out. And it's not talking about perfection. I know Jesus said, you know, be perfect as the Lord thy God is perfect. But he's pointing out how we cannot and our need for a Savior. And God, you know, he's at work, and there should be a motivator. There should be something driving us to pursue and to apply. And those moments where we miss it, right, where we just, I'm sorry, I blew it. I'm not, I'm not contributing to unity today, Tyson. Man, well, let's repent of that. Let's restore that fellowship. Let's keep moving forward. So it's unity in action. So there, there it is. There's our question. Paul defines, here's what unity is. This is what it looks like in your church. It should look like in your life. Then he goes to the, I think, the most important question for us this morning is how do we get it? And once we get it, how do we keep it? So important. So my last point here this morning is unity obtained. I thought that was clever. Verses 3 and 4, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but, contrast, right, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look Look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So I think there's three things that are very important that you and I need to put into application. It's how we get unity in our church, how we keep it. Number one, I think he says, is the don't, right? This is my don't point. Don't compare yourselves to others. Paul says, right, the first part, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. So whatever is happening, whatever is going to happen, whatever action that is going to take place, he says, look, I don't want you to do it this way. Right? So there's your don't. And I just kind of stumbled, I just boiled this down to, to the most basic rudiment elements. When we compare ourselves to others, if so-and-so's idea is accepted over my idea, or, or man, I wish I would have did it like that, or it does one of two things. Either boasts us up, right, puffs up our pride, or we feel horrible. Like, man, I'm, I, man, I never get anything right. Right? And that's, so that's not our point. We want to don't compare yourselves to others. We should be looking to Christ. Run this race that's been marked out for you. Right? Set your eyes on Jesus. Right? So don't look to one another. That's where we miss it. Usually when our eyes are looking at the wrong things, that's where we, we fall into sin. We fall into a whole bunch of other stuff we shouldn't be doing. So here's the don't. Don't compare yourselves to others. But then he gives us the do. That sounds kind of funny. The do, right? He says, humble yourselves and value others. There's the great contrast. Don't do this, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So Paul takes this little, little idea and he says, look, I'm going to break this down. Right? If you've experienced this stuff in Jesus, this is what unity is. Those same things correlate in what they look like in action in your church. Right? Then he goes, look, here, here it is. here's how you get it. Here's how you keep it. When you operate within the church, as you conduct yourselves in a daily life, don't compare yourselves to others. But in humility, right, in lowliness of mind, he says, esteem, right? I use the word value, value others. Show respect, right? Show regard. If someone has a different opinion, that's okay, right? Let me hear them. If they think of things a little different, they operate a little, that's okay, let me hear you. As long as we unify ourselves around truth, right, it's going to be okay, and the enemy's not going to get a foothold into these things, and the last part here, the third thing, I kind of put summing up, right? Live for others. If you want to sum this up, Paul says, look, here's the foundation of it. If you can live for others, right? And I know in our Christian faith, we live for Christ, right? We, we serve him with our mind, our heart, our, our soul, our body, our strength, everything. We love our neighbor as ourselves. And here I'm talking about just unity in the church. So I'm talking about the idea of salvation, but unity in the church. We can live for others, he says in verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. So Paul understands, look, you have to give time and attention to things that are important, right? You have to do that. But in the midst of doing that, don't neglect others, right? Live for others. Be aware of others. Think of others. There's a story of a, from the Chinese evangelist watchman, Ni. Nee. He tells the story of a Christian he knew in China. He was a, a poor rice farmer. In the morning, he would go up and, and pump water into the, the rice paddies in which he was growing rice. And when he would return the next day, he realized that the neighbor who lived down the hill 
would open up the dikes surrounding the Christian's field and let the water fill his own. So for a while, the Christian ignored the injustice, but at last it became desperate. So he met and prayed with other Christians and came up with this solution. The next day, the Christian farmer rose early in the morning and first filled his neighbor's fields. Then he attended his own. And Watchman Nee tells that the neighbor subsequently became a Christian. His unbelief was overcome by a genuine demonstration of Christ's humility and Christ-like character. You know, so we talk about unity as, as an action. It is seen. It's important in the church and how we conduct ourselves and how our testimony, right, is represented in the community that others are looking. And that happens on an individual basis, but it happens as a collective whole as well. And the challenge for us this morning is to maintain. One of the great things I love, one of the many of the great things I love about Faith Bible is your genuineness. We genuinely love. That's not hard for you to do. And we want to be a church that grows, that others can experience that, that we maintain these things, that we maintain unity before the gospel, that we have those moments, okay, it's okay, you're my brother, you're my sister, we can work through this. Because at the end of the day, mercy, right? Jesus is my motivator. And as we conduct ourselves and we have this attitude and this mentality, as we conduct ourselves in society, there are others who are watching. How does the church react? How does this person react? So unity is so important. And from here, Paul is going to go into this next passage and he's going to use the greatest example ever of Jesus. He's going to go further. He's going to elaborate this idea. Here it is, church. But look at Jesus. Consider him. So this morning, we set that challenge before each and every one of us. Just pursue this. Fight for this. Right now, at the sake of truth, we have to maintain truth. Otherwise, we cease to be a church, in my mind. At least a Christian one. We have to maintain truth, integrity of Scripture. Right? Lift high Christ. In the midst of that, continue to seek and love one another with the right motivation. So with that, I want to pray for us. And I would encourage you. Let this be in your prayer life. Lord, pray for my church. Pray for Faith Bible. Pray for the leadership. Especially in the upcoming months as we talk about expanding our leadership. Please be a prayer that our desire, our heart would always be truth. Always be the pursuit of unity. Always be out of respect and love for one another. Because God has made you. God has saved. If you're a believer, God has saved you. Right? God is at work in you. God has placed tremendous value upon you. So as a church, we want to realize that and pursue unity. So with that in mind, let me pray for us this morning. Lord, once again, I I just say thank you for this time. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being at work in us. Thank you, Lord, that Maybe in our own lives, we might even have given up on us. You, you would never do that. And I pray that as we operate as a church, as we love one another, as, as, uh, as we function, as we do ministries, I, I pray that you would give us um, your eyes as we look at others and how you value and how you love. Let us realize the mercy we have. Let us be motivated by that, that our, that our conduct would not be a bunch of do's and don'ts that it would be motivated in you. The right reason we would carry out, that we would, in lowliness of mind, esteem others. And because of Jesus, we would not pursue anything with selfish ambition or conceit. That we would, as we live this life and we have to attend to the things that are important for us and our families, that, that Lord, we'd look out for the interests of others. That you would guide us this way under the power of your Spirit. I also pray, Lord, for what it means to have genuine fellow, true fellowship. Let us realize that that our fellowship connected to you should be living out and our fellowship connected to others. And if there's a break there, Lord, I know we live in a a difficult time with different, different views and a society that is not desiring anything to do with Christianity. But as a church and as brothers and sisters in Christ, Help us, Lord, to maintain those connections of fellowship. So, Lord, I pray in the power of your Spirit, for your glory, that you would lead us. 
I pray for the future leadership of this church that our desire would never waver from your truth and that this church would continue to grow in our genuine love, our love for you and our love for one another. Thank you, Lord, for the men and women here this morning. I pray your blessing upon them. Continue, Lord, continue to be at work in us, making us usable for the kingdom. And just like Paul, Lord, let our joy be fulfilled in this. We love you, Lord. We love you. We pray this for your glory, for your kingdom. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.